I'll call the meeting to order of the State Government Policy, Finance, and Elections Committee. Today being Tuesday, February 1st, 2022, for the record. Glad to be back again, uh, mostly in person. Uh, we're uh, working on a hybrid system today. So there'll be those who will be doing Zoom online and others who will be here uh, in person at the committee hearings. And to let you know, um, we are back into normal functioning with Zoom as an option, but being here in person is much preferable, better communication, uh, better understanding, and uh, support for everything that's needed to have a committee. So welcome to all of you. Glad you can join us in whatever way. Um, but that is uh, the start that we have today on our agenda. And because it is a hybrid, which means in person and online, I just want to remind especially our committee members who are here today and our staff that you log in as usual under Zoom, and that will be your camera for the online version. But then you need to mute your microphone on your laptop and use the table microphone uh, to speak to um, and whenever it is. For those who wish to speak, those who are here in person, do like usual, raise your hand here at the table. Those who are online, you can use the uh, chat feature and raise your hand from there. All right, is that, have I kind of gotten the housekeeping terms? Okay. Um, so then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have, uh, since it's the first time of this legislative session, we're going to go ahead and have an introduction and of uh, both committee members and our staff. So we're going to start with committee members who are here today at the committee table. And Senator Clausen, you're going to get to be the first one to uh, get things started. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. The start of a new session, happy to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Greg Clausen, member of the Senate, and I serve the communities of Apple Valley, Rosemont, Northeast Lakeville, and Coates. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Clausen. And then I'll go to Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I'm Senator Howe, Jeff Howe. I serve uh, in District 13, and it basically wraps around the St. Cloud area. Glad to be here. Thank you, Senator Howe. Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair, and we'll have audio only right now. Sorry for being late. I'm State Senator Mark Cran, representing Senate District 32, Chisago, and Isani counties. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Eric Pratt, I represent uh, Senate District 55, which is Scott County. Thank you very much, Senator Pratt. And I'm Senator Mary Kiffmeyer, Chair of the Committee, and I also come from uh, Senate District 30, which is uh, Big Lake, Elk River, Otsego, Albertville, St. Michael, Hanover, and 14 homes in Dayton. And then we'll go to members who are online today. I will call you because it makes it a little bit easier. Senator Fateh, why don't you start us off? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Senator Omar Fateh, uh, representing District 62, which is in uh, South Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to have you here today. Uh, oh, and Senator Osmick. Uh, Senator Dave Osmick, representing District 33, West Hennepin County, Lake Minnetonka. Uh, and very happy to be with you today remotely. I will be in as 99% of the time from this point forward. I just had something I needed to be out in District 4 today. So... Um, we really need to be on site as much as possible. I agree with you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Osmick. Uh, just will just mention to you, your voice is quite soft. And... Um, My voice is quite soft? That's better. <laughs> yes, it was. I don't know if I, I, okay. I'm doing a smart oh, thing by oh, saying oh. anything or not. <laughs> oh, great. Glad to have you here, Senator Osmick. So next we'll go to, I believe, um, let's see, who do we have that's online? Senator Carlson uh, is having, is not going to, it will be joining us later, so we'll do the introduction when Senator Carlson join us. And so I... Um, I think we've got them all. Then we're going to go to the staff, and I'm going to start with uh, committee administrator. Hi, 
am committee administrator uh, Alec Bjorn. And then we'll go to the committee legislative assistant. I am Christina Wilson, the committee legislative assistant. <laughs> okay, and then we will have also um, our committee as well. So we will have we have both a GOP, a Republican researcher, and we have a Democrat researcher. Would both of you uh, come forward and introduce yourselves? Hi, my name is Joey, and I am the Republican researcher. Okay, and the Democrat researcher. Okay, not here. All right, fantastic. And then we also have nonpartisan staff as well. And so I'm going to ask uh, Ms. James if you might just come on and go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Stephanie James, Senate Counsel. Andrew. Thank you, Madam Chair. Andrew Erickson, uh, Fiscal Analyst for the State Government Committee. All right. We also have another uh, counsel, uh, Alexi Stangle, who is not with us today. So thank you, everybody. I'm glad to have you all with us today. And so our agenda, we do not have bills uh, that require votes. Uh, and today we are hearing from uh, getting an update um, on a couple items. Uh, we have Lorna Smith with uh, Minnesota Management and Budget and they announced a March premium paid holiday implementation. This has to do with state government employees. And so we uh, want to get an update. That's an unusual situation, not been done before. We want to get an understanding for that. We'll start off with that. And then we're also, we had a, a Minnesota IT technical issue, and we have a couple staff here from them who are going to just talk with us a little bit about that. That's part of the purview of the State Government Committee is uh, those areas of operation. So we want to start out today by hearing from them. And so, Ms. Smith, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and then go ahead and uh, make your presentation. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer. I'm Lorna Smith, the Director of Employee Insurance at Minnesota Management and Budget. CGIP, the State Employee Group Insurance Program, is part of employee insurance. Um, we have a PowerPoint. Is that up? It's coming up, I believe, now. Here it is. OK. So we're on to slide two. CGIP administers the Minnesota Advantage Health Plan that's offered to state employees. Advantage is fully self-insured, which means that the state assumes the financial risk for this medical plan's costs. We set rates or premiums at a level projected to cover the cost of claims, plan administration, and to maintain a medical contingency reserve. These contingency reserves are necessary to ensure the financial integrity of the program. They cover anticipated cost overages or unfavorable budget variances. Their ability to safeguard the program allows the premiums to be more stable. Because it carries the program through these periods of unexpected expenditures, it eliminates the need for large rate changes year over year. Next slide, please. The reason we're conducting a medical premium holiday is because the reserves grew unprecedentedly high in 2020. Ms. Smith, I'm so sorry to interrupt your stream of thought here, but it, you are fairly soft and a lot of detail we need to hear. So if you can just really lean into your microphone. Okay, is this better? Yes. Okay. So these reserves, they grew un unprecedentedly high, as you can see on this slide in plan year 20, they grew over $123 million. This was due to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020, individuals sought less medical care while providers reduced their offerings of in-person visits and elective procedures. This change in utilization resulted in a large drop in medical spending and consequently a higher reserve. On this chart, the green line is our target reserve level. 
and the blue line is the year-end actual reserve level. We expect the reserves to be largely close to the target. We annually adjust the premiums to bring the reserves closer to the targets. You can see that in plan year 14, the reserves were high, but in plan years in 15 and 16, we successfully spent them down. By 2017, they were up and between 18 and 19, they'd leveled and we expected a decline in 2020. Next slide, please. What actually happened in plan year 20 is that claims went down significantly, which leaves unspent dollars, which drive up the reserves. This line illustrates the annual claim growth. In plan years 12 through 19, the claims grew at a steady pace. Then in plan year 20, there's a significant drop in claim spending, followed by a more expected trajectory into plan year 21. This drop in claims parallels the plan year 20 increase in the reserve level. If we can move to the next slide, please. To spend down the reserves, we're holding a medical premium holiday during the month of March, 2022. A premium holiday is a period during which, the CIG, during which CIGIP does not charge employers or employees premiums. The expectation is that by not collecting premiums for a period, the reserves will go down by that uncollected amount. This premium holiday applies to all three branches of state government, as well as the quasi state agencies that participate in the program through a statutory authorization. In addition to employers, it applies to active enrolled employees. It also includes under age 65 retirees who receive an employer contribution for medical coverage as well as employees on COBRA or leave. The next slide, please. Medical premiums are generally paid during two pay periods each month. During each pay period, SIGIP anticipates collecting just under $42 million. By hold a premium holiday during both pay periods in March, payers will retain nearly $84 million in waived premium contribution. This 84 million includes all funds, all participating employers and participating employees. To be clear, this 84 million is what the plan will forego, but it's not what state agencies will receive. Of those dollars, approximately 75 million is attributed to employers and 8.6 million is attributed to employees. If you could go to the next slide. This chart illustrates how the 75 million for employers is allocated. You can see that the executive branch agencies retain about 50 million. Of that, about 20 million is general fund dollars, while the other 30 million is in all other funds. The judicial branch retain about 5.5 million. The bulk is in the general fund. The legislative branch is nearly a half million. Minnesota State will retain 17 million while the remaining 2 million is attributed to the quasi state agencies, such as the Minnesota Historical Society and the Minnesota State Fair. Next slide, please. Throughout the pandemic, we closely monitored the medical premiums expenditures and reserves. Certainly by March of 2021, we understood that the reserves were well beyond our target. And at least by summer, I understand there were limited discussions around the premium holiday with agencies so that they could plan on these funds as they set their budgets. We made a formal announcement to employers and employees in September 2021, which was prior to agencies finalizing their supplemental budget requests. Next slide, please. SIGIP's increase in reserve and drop in claims was not unusual for employer medical programs in 2020. Other medical plans, both in the state and nationally, also experience these unexpectedly low utilization levels, which leaves excess dollars in reserves. We did research to see how other employer groups were dealing with their excess reserves. It appears that most employers groups did something like a premium holiday. Some called it a partial premium reduction, while others called it premium credits, and some, like us, called it a premium holiday. When the groups return these funds also varies. For example, the state of Tennessee held a premium holiday in June of 21. 
and the New Jersey School Insurance Plan is holding a premium holiday this month. Now I've included Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota on this list. They are not an employer group. They are a health insurance company, but I included them here because they were in the news and as a fully insured program, they were able to do theirs early. They gave one-time premium credits of 10 to 25% to Medicare members, people who purchase individual health plans and certain fully insured business customers during their October 2020 billing. We didn't find any employer groups who did theirs in 2020. They could exist, but we didn't find them. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Once we hold this holiday, we'll still have a healthy reserve. We believe that higher reserves are necessary in the short term to guard against the uncertainty around higher claims. There's concern industry-wide that claims could spike in the near term due to pent up demand for medical care. When we think about this possible increase in medical claims, direct COVID-19 related costs could drive this increase, but our greater concern is that people will have foregone health care, so will present sicker and therefore their care will be more expensive. At the end of plan year 2022, the premium holiday and after the premium holiday, we anticipate the contingency reserves to be over our target by about $125 million. We've projected rates over the next four years so that the reserves will be on target by the end of plan year 25. That is this our meeting is being recorded. That is our standard method for managing reserve levels. However, we will consider the need for another premium holiday. This plan will allow us to weather a possible spike in claims while still responsibly managing the fund. With that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, notified that Senator Carlson has joined the um, meeting. So, Senator Carlson, uh, if you're, uh, would you like to introduce yourself or do you want to wait till later? We'll just give it time. We'll just wait. We're glad to have you uh, listening as well. So thank you very much, Ms. Smith. I appreciate your presentation. And members, um, you're able to ask questions now. Senator Pratt. Uh, whoa. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my voice isn't soft. My microphone isn't soft. Um, no, I appreciate the presentation. And um, I just wanted to, to ask a quick question around uh, the reserve that we saw on page three and um, the, the, the spending that we saw on the spending increases we saw on page four, it appears we've been over reserved in CGIP since 2017. It increased in 18 and 19 before we saw the huge spike in, in 2020. Uh, I guess my question is, did you consider doing a, uh, uh, a reduction in premium that would address the long-term uh, impacts of, of uh, the fund versus just a, a one-time payment holiday. And, and, and I bring that up because not only did we see the dip on page four in the spending, but in 2021, it seemed to get back up to kind of the linear trend. So understanding there, there's probably a need to be over-reserved a little bit, but not as much as we are, and, and if we can afford to give a payment holiday, why aren't we just giving premium relief overall? Good question. Uh, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chair, Senator. That is, that is an excellent question. Well, when we set the premiums each year, we take into consideration the amount we expect to spend on claims, plan administration cost, and reserve needs. So we do adjust the premium annually to bring down the reserves or to bring them up as we think is necessary. Um, for plan year 2022, we had projected that we needed a 3.6% increase. And we did reserve, limit that to a 3% increase in an effort to also try to spend down the reserves. Um, when you get an increase, or at, at the size that we have in the reserves, spending 
you can't really control that by um, limiting the premiums. What we would have had to do to bring down the reserves in 22 by $84 million would be to, de to have decreased the premiums by nearly 6%. That would have caused us presumably to spend down the 84 million over that 12 month period, but it would have required almost an 18% premium increase the next year to get our spending back up. So by increasing the, res or the premiums by the amount that we think was necessary to, contain to continue at our level of spending and then doing a premium holiday, we're able to reduce the, the reserves quickly in one month, give that money back in a timely manner and hold the premium steady to make it easier for budgeting purposes. Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I don't know if this is a question as much as it is maybe just a reaction. Um, I, I'm concerned with the premium holiday and the fact that it causes that reserve to kind of whipsaw. We're gonna see a huge decrease in the reserve and then we may see an increase later on versus uh, giving a, a, a premium reduction, uh, which allows us to more gradually draw down that excess reserve. And I bring that up because we're, you know, here we are at, at uh, 40 year uh, inflation rates that are at 40 year highs. And, you know, our employees need more money in their paycheck each and every month, not just a one time uh, uh, gift. And so I, I guess I would. You know, that's the reaction I have to, you know, to at least what I've heard, and I and I hope that um, I'd hope that CGIP maybe takes another look at this. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Anybody else, Senator Hall? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess, you know, you kind of explained that just a little bit, but what other options were there? Uh, it, it, you had the the premium holiday, which I, I, I guess I agree with Senator Pratt on this. I, 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 don't, I don't think that, I think that's a one-time thing. I, I think more planning needs to go into it. But what other options are there besides the premium reduction and the, and the premium holiday? Is there, a, what is the long-term effects of this and what other options are there out there uh, to look at with, with these reserves, the way they, they keep going up? Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer, Senator. Um, you know, our, our job, as I said, is to set the premiums annually, and we strive to set them at a level that breaks even at the end of the year in terms of our claims cost, the administration, and maintain the reserves at the level that we need them at. Um, at the same time, it's next to impossible to predict claims costs um, that closely. You know, we could have a couple of miscarriage or not miscarriages, but pre pre premature births. Those cost well north of a million dollars each. So there's no good way that we can always just be right on track with the level of claims. So it's our job to monitor the reserves and set the claims as, or the premiums as close to the level that we need as we can. Um, we do watch the reserve levels closely. We, we reduce the premiums that, you know, every year um, to help keep them in check. And that's, I think, the, the way that we can manage them um, year in, year out. In this case, we had um, a one-time event, this, hopefully, this pandemic that caused claims to tank. And it was a sudden thing. It happened over a period of months. And so... We feel very confident that giving back this money as a one-time event is a very responsible action to take. Um, the only other way, I think, to handle it would be to simply take money out of the reserves and put that into another fund, say, take out the $84 million and put it in the general fund. Um, we don't recommend that because it's an extremely expensive thing to do. It was done in the early 2000s, the 23 million was taken out of the reserves and put into the general fund. But what happens is the feds then want their share. They pay some employee salaries through their federal dollars 
those dollars flow into the reserves so the Fed see part of the reserves is their share. And so when we took out the 23 million, we had to pay the feds another 5 million for their share and some penalty costs. So that 23 million move cost um, 28 million. So that leaves us um, with setting premiums and having a premium holiday. Thank you, Ms. Smith. All right, uh, Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Ms. Smith, you, you spoke about the, uh, the spike uh, the downward trend in the utilization of healthcare services, and uh, and so and that reflected in, in the need to to do this holiday. You also mentioned at a high level, or I think briefly, that we anticipate that there will be a spike. Could you go into more of that? Because I I think I when I look at where we're at, there's been a massive avoidance of the healthcare system by a large chunk of the population. And I'm not sure that the healthcare system will be able to accommodate uh, the need, even if it does arise. But could you cover, you know, the, uh, will that spike, then the, the, the reduction then be met by an increase in your estimates that will be equal or larger to the, the reduction in the spike or the lack of utilization? I have great concern because the, those, that healthcare avoidance, there's some really critical people who need that access and have been avoiding. Thus, it will come up in a later point in time as a more serious health issue, which will likely drive more expenses. So if you could cover a little bit more about how you anticipate or what you put into your factors in, in looking at what that future spike would be. Thank you. Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer, Senator. Um, th that's a great question. If I could answer that, um, I'd be a consultant with somewhere making millions and millions of dollars. Um, but seriously, we work very closely with our actuaries. and. Um, we're very confident that doing this premium holiday and at least in the near term, carrying uh, a reserve higher than we normally would will put us in a perfectly safe position to weather any increase in um, claims. Um, you know, as, as to those increase in claims, you know, we are reasonably certain that what it's gonna come from is exactly what you described, which is people who are not getting the health care that they should they'll present sicker and therefore their claims will be more costly to treat. Um, I don't think anybody knows when that will happen or if it will happen, but it seems likely. Okay, thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, Senator Claussen is gonna go next. Senator Claussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is kind of relates to Senator Coran's question and your answer, but uh, COVID definitely has an effect on people accessing the fund. And as we're moving out of uh, the COVID situation, are you seeing any of the providers increasing their rates uh, to compensate uh, for lost revenue during this time? So do you anticipate that you're going to see uh, rates increasing, which will have an effect on the fund? Good question also. Thank you, uh, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer, Senator. Um, we've not seen that yet. Um, we, uh, next month, we will start working on our contracts for the next year, and that's at the point we will start talking closely with um, the health plans and understanding where clinics are going with their costs. But to date, we have not seen that. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Okay, Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, could you, ex where are these reserves held, I guess? Could you explain to us? Uh, I, I take it they're just not uh, held in the local bank. or So where are the reserves held? Where are they, inv are they invested? And was the stock market uh, part of the increase in the, uh, in the increase in the reserves? Thank you. Ms. Smith. Chair Kiffmeyer, the reserves are held um, in the same place all the state's monies are held. Um, so wherever the SBI invests those dollars. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> Senator Howe. I, I guess my question would be, is that at the, as, at the state board investment or where is that? I mean, that's something that's important to know because if it's, if it's held with the state board in, of investments and they did a 30% last year, uh, that could definitely show us why we had that big increase. And, uh, you know, it's important to, 
to have that in our idea. It's not just the premiums and the lower health care costs that uh, the not the activity and the usage of our health care. That's also uh, would be evidence that our stock market did that increase. So I, I think it's important for us to find that out. I would agree, Senator Howe. And Ms. Smith, um, I appreciate the situation that this may have been a question that uh, you were not prepared to answer, certainly to understand that. But could you please uh, make sure that the agency, MMB, or whoever is the responsible entity would get us the answer to that question? Where do those, where are those funds held? Are they invested? And if yes or no, uh, just give us an idea. Because even when you're talking about uh, this much money, even a small, uh, even in a bank or something like that, that small amount of interest can have an impact on those reserves. And it would not be surprising that at least a portion of them might be invested. So if you can get the information for that and send it to uh, our committee, and then we will get it out to all members of the committee so they can have the information. Could you do that, Ms. Smith? Chair sure, Kiffmeyer, yes. And we, we do receive uh, interest income on those dollars, so that they are invested along with the state's other dollars. But I will get more detail on that for you. Ms. Smith, we need more specifics than, than that, okay? That'd be great. I have a few questions for you as well, Ms. Smith. Does state law give you any requirements as far as how much in reserves? Do they cap the reserves? Is there a recommended amount of reserves? I know that uh, we're self-insured as the state of Minnesota, but other uh, folks who run insurance companies have a reserve requirement, and if they get above that, they have to do certain things. So because we're self-insured, can you tell me about uh, that statutory requirement? Is there any for us as a self-insured for the state of Minnesota? Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer. Well, we are authorized to carry reserves in 43A, and we work with our actuaries to set the level that we believe is needed. And we, that level currently is set at 16.7% of the projected claims for the next year. So at 16.7% on a very quick math here, I think others are sharpening their pencils as well. We are significantly beyond that. Um, I'd be interested, in, and so there is no statutory requirement. Uh, the, it's set by your actuaries, but there is no statutory requirement in regards to those reserves, and that if they get up to a certain amount, what has to happen if it gets to that amount. Is that correct, Ms. Smith? Chair Kiffmeyer, that, that's my understanding, but you know, as responsible administrators, we recognize that the reserves were well in excess of what they should be, and we felt that we're taking action mm -hmm. to get them under control. And Ms. Smith, I want to be sure also that we get the um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, and in the future, I just want to mention, we need to have PowerPoint presentations to this committee ahead of time so that members of this committee have them uh, at the table and then also uh, available online as well. So uh, to you, Ms. Smith, and to anybody else uh, in the agencies to, to keep that in mind. A question I have for you uh, from my memory in regards to one of the PowerPoint slides that um, the category of people were current employees, under 65 retirees. I'm not quite sure. A uh, question I have for you, are those who are over 65 retirees uh, part of the premium holiday in March? Ms. Smith. Chair Kiffmeyer, they are not. They are not in this Advantage program. Uh, over 65 retirees are in a different plan. Over 65 are not included because? They're not in this Advantage Health Plan. They're in a different program. They're, they're in a different different program. Okay. Right. Interesting. It's, it's, yeah. Well, in fairness to everybody, I think everybody who pays the premium to the state on our insurances, they should all get uh, the benefit of that. They all paid in and they should all get the benefit. And I would like that maybe to be reconsidered 
and uh, to uh, reach out for that if they're paying into and helping for the reserve fund to accumulate they should get the benefit of it it's just a matter of fairness and treat everybody in a fair way I think that's really important so if you could take that back Ms. Smith and ask them to uh, consider that and then if you'd respond to me uh, as soon as possible uh, in regards to that whatever the answer is um, I would like to know about that uh, the other thing is you mentioned that if you had done a premium reduction to equal the same amount you're doing as a holiday, it would have necessitated an 18% increase of premiums in 2023. Could you explain, I mean, 18% increase after um, this kind of a holiday, could you explain why that 18%? Ms. Smith. Chair Kiffmeyer, um, wh what we would have had to do is reduce the plan year 22 premiums by 5.8%. We were scheduled actually for a 3.6% increase. So it would be um, like about a 10% decrease. And technically the way we did it in plan year 23, we have already planned a 3.6% increase. And so the 18% increase would have actually happened in plan year 24. And um, I think that's just the whipsaw of what would be nearly a 10% increase or decrease followed by about a 3%. Um, it's just the way the math plays out. It's kind of like compounding, I think. Well, Ms. Smith, I know you're, you're sent here by your agency. Uh, to respond as the best you could here. However, um, it seems to me if you had just not done the 3.5% increase and kept the premiums the same for 22, and you could have done the same for 23. Um, uh, when I take a look at these reserves, I think it's just a greater fairness to all those who pay into uh, these reserves, um, everybody should. Because the other thing is, you get a premium holiday in the month of March, so employees who come later, or the ones who leave sooner, who are also paying into um, and are responsible for the accumulation of the reserve, are getting no benefit from that. And so I, I find that to be unfair as far as the category of, of um, folks you are using who pay into the system, and also the choosing of the month of March in regards to that group of employees versus the other 11 months. So that's my feedback to that, and it's a concern that I've heard, and uh, I would share that. I think that's an important consideration, and I would much prefer, and I think if we look at this right now, the trend line in the increase of the reserves ongoing actually into 23, strongly recommend that the instead of an increase in premiums, that uh, those premiums be frozen at the previous year's level. I think Senator Clausen's comment is a good one, and so um, I think your answers, we're not seeing that right now, that, that those are, but in case they are, I think we certainly want to have that con consideration, but I would say, Ms. Smith, if you can take it back to your folks, uh, to uh, more strongly encourage you to look at an overall premium freeze or reduction uh, to give fairness to the entire year to all employees and to all those who pay into the state's self-insured um, program. I think that's more fair and more equitable in regards to um, all of those who uh, we serve. So thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, I appreciate it. I, uh, Senator Howe, you have another question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I guess it just so happens that uh, the the, the holiday, the premium holiday, ends up being $84 million. But is there a reason that we had to do $84 million in one year? Or could, you know, kind of going off of what uh, Chair Kiffmeyer's question is, is, is there, would it be been better or is it a, a possibility just to, just to not do the increase and just see that premium, see that reserve gradually come down over time? Or was it is it imperative that we drop that reserve 
in a hurry to get it down or, or I, I, I see, I just don't understand why we had to drop it significantly in a month rather than taking a, a different approach to reduce that premium or keep it level and watch that reserve come down back down to a reasonable level over a longer period of time, especially when we don't know what the, uh, the, uh, the claim, claims are going to be here in the next couple of years. I, I, would, have, I would just... I just don't understand the approach, I guess, to, to drop that $84 million in, a, in a one month when we could do it over a longer period of time, given that we don't know what the claim history is going to be with this pent up, what we think is a pent up demand that would have caused us to increase premiums. I just, I'm just struggling with the concept. Thank you for that comment, Senator Howe. And I think without question, um, this is a strong consideration that we are making to you, Ms. Smith, uh, to do that. And that's why my initial question had to do with um, was there statutory requirements in regards to this reserve. I felt also to choose one month to drop it like that, um, I think is uh, an important consideration for us uh, to see us going forward in the future. Uh, since there is none, uh, members, uh, it's something that we should, others um, have had requirements when a reserve, you know, kind of an upper limit, and when it hits that, that there's a mechanism by which, and that we should take a look at the um, uh, Department of Commerce uh, governs with that, so we'll take that in. I'm seeing that it seems as though we have some uh, technical issues here. I don't know if that was true or not. I just want to make sure that um, online... I got a notice that the 40-minute limit was up, so I'm not quite sure what that is. That should not be happening for a committee hearing that lasts an hour and a half. I'm just mentioning it now just in case. So, All right. Well, Ms. Smith, I'll look forward to that additional information. And if MMB would like to have a further discussion with me in regards to this matter, I would be glad to uh, take some time to have that discussion but want to... Uh, strongly encourage uh, a little different approach than this holiday approach, being more fair and equitable to all, and in particular to consider that those retirees over 65 who have paid into the reserve system, uh, that that be changed to include them uh, as well, so that all who pay into that reserve system have that benefit. I'll look forward to hearing back from you, Ms. Smith, and thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, members, for all your thoughtful questions. Appreciate it. Okay, um, we're going to go to the next agenda item, and that is an update uh, from uh, Minnesota IT Minute, we call it. There was a technical issue on December 21st, and so we have today John Eiten, uh, Deputy Commissioner, and Rohit Tandon, the Chief Information Security Officer, Thank you to both of you for being with us today. And if you'd like to go ahead and initiate things, uh, of course, your names for the audio record and for those watching online. And if you would uh, then go ahead and uh, make your initial comments. With that, I'll give it to you, Mr. Eiton. Thank you, Madam Chair um, and committee members. For the record, my name is John Eiton. I'm uh, Minnesota IT Services Deputy Commissioner. Uh, as, uh, as the, as the chair mentioned on the morning of December 21st, 2021, uh, Minute identified a technical operational outage that was impacting users' ability to access some state systems at multiple state agencies. Uh, this included users at the Department of Human Services, Department of Corrections, and Department of Veterans Affairs, amongst others. Uh, Minute, Minute's incident response processes were immediately activated uh, based on system monitoring and alerting uh, that is in place across our environment. The incident management process really brings together uh, technical experts, cybersecurity experts on the internal side, as well as ven vendor partners, uh, all together to really collaboratively review the incident and identify potential solutions. Uh, we had multiple minute operational and security teams engaged to assess the issue as part of that incident response process. And these teams ultimately identified the underlying cause of the issue and fully restored services uh, beginning the, the morning of the next day, December 22nd. Uh, Minute partnered with key vendors through existing support contracts to respond to this outage, to identify the cause, to restore services, and, and to conduct post-incident 
investigation and analysis. Uh, while early indications did point at uh, malicious cyber activity as a potential cause of this outage, technical analysis conducted with external vendor partners during the outage ultimately confirmed that this event was not related to any malicious cyber uh, event or activity. Rather, the outage was caused by a third-party technology management tool that was interfering with users' ability to, to authenticate and be granted access to certain state systems and technology services. Uh, this extended outage created hardships for the impacted agencies, requiring the use of some workaround solutions to maintain core business operations. In some cases, required the activation of business continuity of operations plans. Uh, Minute has initiated a dual track after action review process for the, this event uh, on both the actions taken to restore services, the lessons learned, the process improvement recommendations, and also collecting uh, business partner feedback. We will identify lessons learned from this incident to inform the development of mechanisms to reduce the likelihood of similar incidents in the future and to inform incident response process improvements overall. I wanna be clear that from the perspective of Minute leadership, incidents such as this are neither routine nor acceptable. Uh, over the last 12 months, this area of our infrastructure has maintained over 99.9% .9 availability uh, with active resilience capabilities in place and exercised on a really a daily basis as we shift workloads across the environment to enable patching and other maintenance activities. So while this outage is undoubtedly an exception to the norm, we nevertheless, nevertheless take the impact of such an outage on our business partners, our external partners, the counties, the people of Minnesota with the utmost seriousness. While we know the cause of the outage, analysis continues with the third party vendor partner involved in other vendor partners to ensure that any and all lessons learned are captured and incorporated into future service improvement plans and incident management processes. Uh, looking forward, it will be critical that we continue to work toward further standardization and modernization of the state's technology environments, leveraging cloud services, tools, and industry standard platforms in order to reduce complexity and obsolescence in the, in the state's technology footprint. Because while this incident was not the result of aging technology, I wanna be clear about that. We know that the presence of such technology in our environment increases complexity, increases the risk of major incidents and successful cyber attacks, and increases the time to resolution when an incident does occur. So we look forward to engaging with members of this committee as we work toward these shared goals. And of course, uh, we would, uh, myself and Assistant Commissioner Rohit Tandon, our Chief Security Officer, would be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Iden. And so, um, from what I hear, Mr. Tandon is available for questions, but doesn't have more to add to your presentation? That's correct, okay. Madam Chair, that's correct. All right. Yep. Okay, members, we'll go ahead and um, go to questions. And again, remember, those of you who are online, use the chat function. If you're here at the table, raise your hand, get recognized, and we'll put you on the list. And Senator Coran, oh, okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assistant Chris, Commissioner Eichten. So um, on the outage, you talked just at the, in your closing portion of it, that it was a third party tech management company that precluded the access. Got a couple questions on it. So did it affect the systems overall, regardless of whether they were hosted premise or in the cloud? What was the total number of hours out? And then bring me back a little bit to the difference between um, three nines availability and four nines availability and the industry standard for highly uh, critical systems in the private sector versus um, any other, versus what state government is, is doing. Is, is three nines sufficient and did that outage violate their three nine uh, service level agreement. Mr. Eichten, you might meet Mr. Tandon too, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will, Madam Chair, Senator Curran, I'll, I'll happily call on Mr. Tandon to offer his technical expertise as well, but I think I can um, speak to a few of these uh, off the bat here. So in terms of the impact of the outage on on-prem hosted technology versus cloud hosted technology. So the cloud-hosted technology that uh, we have in this area of our infrastructure was not impacted by this event. And it, that really does speak to uh, the value of 
the strategy that we have in place right now is it relates to infrastructure modernization, which is to move to cloud services where possible. There is a resilience um, baked in to cloud services by design uh, that will imp improve overall the, the reliability of systems and the, and the time to recovery during, during incidents and events. Um, so hopefully that answers your first question. Total hours out. Uh, it's it's a, a difficult question to answer because of the sporadic intermittent nature of this event. Uh, but I can tell you that the event started at 10 a.m. Um, on the 21st. Resolution was identified at roughly 10 a.m. the next day. Uh, but the impact of the outage was, was not consistent across agencies or even within agencies across users. Uh, so it's, it's, it's difficult to sort of give you a total sum hours uh, related to related to the event. I can tell you that the percentage of our of the infrastructure in question, the percentage that was impacted by this event was roughly 10%. Um, so it did not affect all agencies. Uh, however, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to um, encourage you to extrapolate that that 10% meant 10% of state employees were impacted. Not all employees are information workers. Um, and then the impact on users was, was not consistent from user to user. As, as far as the three nines versus the four nines, I, I mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, it's to give you a little finer point, this area of our infrastructure has a 99.97% availability over the last 12 months. Uh, but in terms of sort of the industry standard between three nines and four nines, uh, that's where I will, I would ask uh, Assistant Commissioner Rohit Tandon to chime in if he has thoughts on uh, that particular question. If, okay, if that, Assistant if Commissioner right, Tandon, go ahead and. Good morning. My name is Rohit Tandon, and I'm, I serve as the Chief Information Security Officer at Minnesota IT Services. So thank you for having me this morning. Just to answer that specific question around the nines dot and the three nines, the six nines, and it all comes down to the availability needs of our agency partners. And the higher the number of nines, the higher the, the lower the number of hours that the agency partner is willing to accept as an outage for that period of time. Um, the three nines is about nine hours of outage at the maximum. So I, I'll have to kind of get the math correctly. I've calculated in my head here, but I, I, I think uh, Deputy Icton referenced that we were at 9.97. And this is based on the service level agreements that we have with our agency partners on how much they expect in terms of availability on this core infrastructure. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Since this was not uh, identified as a security breach uh, and we're, we know how critical it is to have uh, computer access for all of our employees, and as we look forward, um, have you identified, are there, are there needs that you will be looking for in the future um, in the terms of modernization to the system or things that you will be requesting from the legislature that you've identified through this uh, process that uh, will prevent uh, outages like this in the future? Mr. Eiton. Madam Chair, Senator Clausen. Uh, Yes, absolutely. I, I want to uh, distinguish between, you know, what is stemming directly from this event versus what has been part of the strategic roadmap um, that Minute has talked about with the legislature for, for some time now. So I uh, included in the governor's budget are at, in sort of two areas, uh, funding to modernize and address obsolete technology throughout the, the technology stack, you might say. So at two levels, one is the infrastructure where we host servers uh, that applications that agencies rely on to do their work live. And right now, the, the majority of our footprint is hosted on-prem, which means there's a data center in the state of Minnesota uh, managed by Minute and our, our private sector partners. Um, the governor is recommending funding to accelerate the shift of that hosting environment into a cloud, a public cloud environment. So think of the big players in this space being uh, Microsoft, AWS, um, Google. By moving into a, a, a cloud construct, what you get is sort of redundancy and resiliency by design. So rather than our applications living in one data center in Minnesota, 
that data for those applications is replicated across multiple data centers across the country. So if there is a natural disaster, uh, uh, a power failure, or whatever might take down a particular data center, uh, there, there's really an immediate failover capability. So ultimately, that is the direction that private industry is moving. That's the direction that Minute and our, our state agency partners would like to move. The longer it takes us to uh, complete that journey, the longer we have an overlapping period of where we are paying for on-prem hosting of our applications as well as cloud hosting of our applications because we're, we're in the midst of that migration and that shift. Uh, so what the governor is proposing is to accelerate that shift and um, move much more rapidly into that, that arena. To give you an example, the Department of Health is the one agency that is uh, majority hosted in the cloud. And it is proven time and time again throughout the state's pandemic response that the ability to scale up and scale down um, computing power in the cloud, some of the security features that are, that are built in by design, the cost controls have, and, and some of the capabilities that are built into the cloud with things like data lakes um, have enabled that Department of Health to really buttress some of those legacy systems and operate at a higher capability level than they otherwise would have. So it really underscored the fact that this is the right strategy um, and the governor is, is supporting, accelerating that strategy in his budget. On the flip side, as opposed to the infrastructure, there's the applications that actually live on that infrastructure. So think of uh, the MinDrive system, driver and vehicle services, the GenTax system at the Department of Revenue. Those systems, not those two systems, but many of the applications in state government are aging, uh, are, do have obsolete technology components or technology components that are nearing obsolescence. And the governor is proposing funding to, in a, in a much more targeted way, address those applications that have significant uh, cyber vulnerabilities associated with them, obsolete components that are, that are coming out of support, uh, and in, in a very methodical way, attack uh, those applications one by one to modernize that application layer of our environment. And that is really what's going to reduce some of the complexity that we have. It will reduce some of the barriers that we have to, to modernizing the infrastructure that would actually improve our security posture. We need to maintain infrastructure that the applications can live on. If the applications are too old, then we need to make trade-offs within our infrastructure that introduce complexity and risk. Uh, and so by both modernizing the foundation as well as uh, the house and the rooms within the building that live on that foundation, to give you sort of a housing analogy, we're gonna come to a much more efficient, uh, a much more capable and agile and a much more secure and cost-effective uh, future state. Um, that's something that, again, private sector has been moving in this direction for a long time. The state has to some degree, as I mentioned, with, with the Department of Health and in other agencies as well, just not to the same degree as the Department of Health. Uh, but we really need to bring the whole state enterprise along in that uh, direction, in that strategy. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if uh, Assistant Commissioner Tandon might have anything to add to from, uh, uniquely from the cybersecurity perspective, but I wanted to give you sort of the full picture looking across you know, the, the cost side, the capability side, and the security side. Thank you, Mr. Eiton. A uh, question I have for you, though, is have you also considered moving to service contracts instead of ownership? Mr. Eiton. Madam Chair, absolutely. Uh, even beyond considering, we, we, we engage in a number of service contracts for uh, to give you uh, a few examples. Uh, the the MinDrive system is hosted by Fast Enterprises. Uh, it's actually hosted in the cloud, but managed by Fast Enterprises. Uh, the uh, our communications and collaboration suite. So think of uh, Microsoft Outlook, Microsoft Teams, um, SharePoint. All of those are, are cloud provided managed services that we procure through Microsoft. Uh, there's a number of all of additional managed services that, that we consume, and, and those service providers were involved with us, really working hand in hand with us to respond to this incident with, because it is part of their mm -hmm. their service contract with us. Okay. Um, and we 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 really worked in hand in hand to make sure that we were completely aligned with what are some very methodical processes that these vendor partners go through. Sometimes it, it can mean it takes a little bit longer to get to um, a final resolution because 
as I said, it is quite methodical, but it, I think as we mentioned um, in the meeting uh, that we had previously, uh, the private meeting we had with you, uh, Madam Chair, on this issue, that ultimately you don't want your, your potential fixes to break more things. And I think you, you, you referenced that um, from your time in the Secretary of State's office. And so going through that met methodical process, following the best practices, taking the time is, is really the thing to do and, and to do it not in a silo, not in a vacuum, just internally, but to bring in those vendor partners uh, who may or may not be able to, to assist us through the event. Okay, thank you, Mr. Eiten. I think uh, the answer to that then is yes, you are looking at service. Um, I had some follow-up, but um, nonetheless, I appreciate that. And the reason why is getting us out of the business of writing software. Uh, what we're important, what we is important to the Minnesotans out there is the service. Whether the state owns the software, builds and manages, and all the maintenance and all the upgrades and all that kind of stuff. Moving to service agreements, I think, um, um, is a big part of that, and it is something uh, we can look to. Uh, Senator Clausen has a follow-up. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just curious uh, if you could provide a time frame on how long uh, such a transition that you've described would take. Mr. Eiten. Madam Chair, Senator Clausen. I would, I would say it, it depends uh, on the resource level that is associated with the transition and, and, the, and, and the strategy that you choose to employ with the transition. I think undoubtedly, given the fact that the state has 28, over 2,800 applications in its portfolio um, and, a, and a diversity of lines of business when you look across all the, dif the different uh, agency services that are delivered, that this is, this is a multi-year journey. But the question is, is it, is it a two-year journey or is it a 10-year journey? Um, I would say from a risk perspective that it is incumbent upon all of us to make sure it's not a 10-year journey. We need to move uh, much more quickly than that. Uh, but it will depend on you know, the resources that are brought to bear and the collective um, engagement and commitment to moving in an accelerated fashion. And that, that's a conversation that okay. we're certainly engaged with our, our agency business partners about. Thank you, Mr. Eiten. Senator Clausen? Okay. Um, all right, Senator Howe. Uh, Madam Chair, I guess my question would be, uh, going back to, to the problem that we had, the outage, uh, was this caused by a third-party patch or update? And didn't they run a test on this prior to going live with the... Uh, with the concern with the application, Mr. Eiten, Madam Chair and Senator Howe, um, so a a vendor patch uh, between one of multiple vendors was involved in this uh, event, but I, I will say that the tool in question with this event uh, did not have a patch uh, or a change made on it in the preceding 30 days before this event. So the root cause analysis that we're in the midst of right now is going to, we, we've identified the proximate cause. Our, our next uh, stage of the after ana action analysis is to dig down into that root cause. Uh, we will see what configurations between the tool that was causing the outage and other um, software tools in our environment might have played into the, the unique um, manifestation of this event. And it was, as I said, intermittent. Uh, and it was inconsistent, which, which makes uh, that analysis all the more challenging. The changes, the patches that vendors uh, provide to us are, are tested before they are provided to us. And I think that's a process that uh, Assistant Commissioner Cannon could probably speak to in more detail. Uh, so Madam Chair, if, 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 um, if you might allow that, it would probably be a, a helpful level of detail for, for Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner Tandon to go into. Okay, uh, Assistant Commissioner Tandon, why don't you go ahead and um add any comments if you have them? Madam Chair, members, that's a good question. And, and technology patches are applied all the time. And they are tested not only by us, but by our vendors that are supporting us and delivering it to us. So we have kind of a back-end recipient of a, of a patch or an update that has been tested by the vendor and many customers as it makes it to our doorstep. But our unique infrastructure may create new challenges that may not have been foreseen 
by the vendor or other customers of this vendor. And in that cycle, it's such a, a mix of complexity and maybe I won't even use the word technology debt that might be interacting with each other and create this unique experience for us. Because even us, when we do receive it, we have a pipeline to test it in our development infrastructure before moving it to a production environment where it's going to impact the broader agencies and partners that work with us. So that cycle also did create that unique combination and that root cause is what the analysis that's in progress right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tandon. All right, um, question I have for you, Mr. Eiten, though, is um, one of the concerns, and I know that in most contracts, uh, when you have a situation like this, uh, there is something as far as compensating you for the cost of this interruption uh, caused by them. So this was a technical interruption, and in the contract and the cost, um, were there, was there compensation coming uh, to your agency in regards to the cost uh, that it was? And so if you could respond to that, Mr. Eiden. Absolutely, uh, Madam Chair. So yes, while, while we know, as we mentioned brief, previously, while we know the proximate cause of the outage, the root cause analysis phase that we're currently in, in terms of the after action process, is what's really going to reveal the ultimate, well, as I said, root cause of the issue. And that process is really gonna inform a review of the contractual terms that we have in place with the vendor in question to determine if there is any mechanism for financial relief that can be sought related to this incident. I would say um, in, in cases such as these, there can be between vendors uh, because it, it, it is often an interaction between multiple vendor products. There can be finger pointing between vendors as to who is really to blame for the incident. Uh, but we will be conducting that a thorough root cause analysis and, uh, and then we'll, we'll take a look at the contractual terms and if there's relief that can be sought, we will certainly seek it. Uh, then there's the go forward, which is really um, frankly what the vendors care most about, which is continuing business with the state of Minnesota. Um, and, and you know that will be another question we look at here, which is, um, are we going to continue to use the tool, or are we going to leverage other um, capabilities of other tools in our environment uh, to bring about the same level of mm -hmm. capability that we have with this tool? And um, okay. you know, ultimately, that will that will have the greatest impact. Thank um, you, thank you, Mr. Wrighton. Question I have for you is. Um, was there in the contract with these vendors or vendors or routinely in our contracts a clause that allows for when this happens and there are additional costs um, that, that it is contractually language written in there that will assist you in recouping those losses? Mr. Eiten. Uh, Madam Chair, so there are a number of standard provisions that, that get at uh, this type of mechanism. Um, we certainly expect high performance and partnership from our vendors, um, and, and we, we do have enforcement mechanisms and contracts. I, I wouldn't want to venture a guess at the specifics of what is included in this particular contract without taking a look, so I'd be happy to um, mm -hmm. consult with our, our contracting team and get back to you on that. Or else, if you'd, if you'd be interested, I'm sure Assistant Commissioner Tandon could maybe speak more broadly to um, some of the mechanisms that are in place across the industry or that we've leveraged in the past. Okay, thank you, Mr. Eiten. I'll look forward to that information as well. Uh, Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and mine was kind of a follow-up to your initial line of thought around the cost, is that just to confirm, uh, Commissioner Eiten, that all of the resources utilized to investigate um, these types of activities, because we didn't know if it was a, a breach or cybersecurity or a technical sure. issue, um, that we have all of those under contract and readily available. Yes, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry. Madam Chair, Senator Curran, yes, that's, cor that's correct. The vendor partners that we brought in to assist with this event uh, were under contract and there wasn't an incremental cost associated uh, with getting that vendor support during the event. Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, Senator Coran, yes. I just wanted to uh, make an invite to the house, to the MMB and Moon, so we have availability for them if you're in person. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Madam Chair. Go ahead. Madam Go ahead, Chair. Senator Coran. I'd like to uh, send a message out to MMB 
and, uh, and our minute staff, our, our minute resources, that we have uh, seats uh, open and available to you to come in and testify in person. Uh, the Capitol is open and the Republican Senate is open, and or the, the entire Senate is open. So this process is designed. We need the interaction. We need your participation in every facet. Just want to send out an invite to all of our testifiers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coran. Yes, we want to be sure that um, the adjustments that came about and uh, are still with us yet, we're able to safely uh, meet and to conduct our business here, uh, but restoring what our country is really about, uh, being able to participate. A concern I have is also with seeing the chairs are empty. We often usually have a lot of people who are here and there is communication that happens uh, that is way more than what I call the flat Stanley approach through Zoom. Uh, while I appreciate um, sometimes uh, at least it's an opportunity, but I think we really lack uh, the full communication that comes with in person. And I think it's important that um, that be restored and we can do that safely and uh, accommodations can be made and all of those things can be done um, as well. And I think more and more uh, are realizing that uh, we are to be in a more comfortable place uh, to be able to um, participate. I want to encourage all of our agencies uh, to be able to, whenever possible, that you could join us in person and do so safely. With that, members, if there's any other comments, uh, we completed the Senator Claussen. Just a comment, Madam Chair, that perhaps if people would wear masks, they might feel more comfortable coming to the uh, Capitol for testimony. Thank you, Senator Claussen. With that, members, and our meeting adjourned, um, our meeting being concluded, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>